I have the pleasure of speaking to Liz Young, Head of Investment Strategy at SoFi. Liz, welcome to Forward Guidance. Thank you. Excited to be here. I'm excited to have you here, Liz. I need you to help me make sense of the markets. It's been very confusing. We're something very close to a 10% drawdown uh, in the S&P 500, NASDAQ a little bit higher. Uh, a lot of the growth stocks have been going through extreme drawdowns and energy has been going up. Uh, the front end of the yield curve has been going up, but unfortunately, the long end hasn't been going up nearly as much. We've had some some yield curve flattening. There's so much to talk about, Liz. Just, just uh, Can I get your broad thoughts to start off? How are you making sense of this market? It's obviously been a rough start to the year, and frankly, I think this is a little overdue. So if we even just rewind about six months and look at the second half of 2021, we knew rate hikes were going to have to come at some point. We knew that inflation was not as transitory as everybody believed it to be. And we had started our tapering program by the end of the year. So having only seen a 5% correction in the broad markets up through the end of the year, this was necessary to shake out some of the excess and shake out some of what I would call multiple expansion that's happened as a result of liquidity and low rates for so long. So a lot of the stress that we're seeing right now, although it seems dramatic and it seems really painful, the pattern that it's happening in makes sense. And that to me, believe it or not, gives me a little bit more calm with the market because what happened in 2021 didn't make a lot of sense. We had 10-year yields that remained historically low in the face of high inflation and the expectation of rising rates. So that didn't make sense. I don't like it when the patterns don't make sense. And we had continued rallies in uh, tech. And, and granted, there were some times throughout the year where it, it went back and forth. But that didn't make sense either, right? It, there shouldn't have been huge rallies in tech. Value should have been a more clear outperformer. So what we're seeing so far in 2022 makes a decent amount of sense. I'm okay with it. I think that this needed to happen as a transition into the next phase of this economic cycle. And when you say it makes sense, why would value outperforming growth make sense? Why would long-term bond yields going up make sense? The idea behind, we'll start with yields, uh, yields going up because we're going to raise policy rates. And when you think about the reason that we're raising policy rates, yes, it's to control inflation, but the Fed is also comfortable doing that because we're in a pretty strong economic condition. We've got decent growth. We have a labor market that's recovered to pre-pandemic levels in, in some areas, uh, but it's tight and it's a, a strong labor market, plenty of jobs available. We've got... Um, a consumer who has been spending and buying a lot more goods than they used to, but a consumer who's been spending and a consumer that's in good shape from a balance sheet perspective. And we've got, we're going to, right now we're hearing about earnings, but it should be our fourth straight quarter of over 20% earnings growth. So we're in good shape as an economy and as corporate America. Because of that, you shouldn't see a depressed 10-year yield, right? People buy long-term treasury bonds when they're afraid. So when they're not afraid, they should sell them and the yield should go up. And that's partially what's happening right now. It also goes up as a result of the expectation of rising rates, the expectation of inflation staying high for an, a little bit longer of a period of time. And that in turn makes you look back at the equity market and say, okay, so if the risk is on the longer end of duration, so if if 10 year yields should go up, right, that's the longer end of duration, then which equities are more exposed to that longer end of duration? And the answer to that is growth. Growth equities are more exposed to that. They get hit harder by a rise in long term rates. OK, so as the Fed raises rates, as inflation goes up, as the 10 year goes up, growth assets get hit harder, which is exactly what we've seen this year. You see the Nasdaq in a deeper correction than the S&P and the Dow. Short duration assets, which then this goes for equities, short duration assets tend to be more in those value categories. So short duration, you can think of them, some of them as dividend paying stocks. So a lot of those fall into the staples and utilities category, but also some of the more cyclical assets that fall into sectors like financials, um, energy, industrials, even some of the materials that aren't as dependent on rising rates uh, or a steady rate picture, and actually in the case of financials, should benefit from rising rates. So that's where the trade-off comes in, and that's the rotation that we've seen to start this year. Granted, the rotation has been negative for everybody, but still the rotation that we've seen, and that's why it makes sense. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I love this uh, the concept of duration. You, you know, the ultimate sort of long duration stocks are very sort of visionary stocks, whether it's you know mining asteroids or, or electric planes. And then the on the total opposite side of the spectrum, you've got you know uh, iron ore miners, things where it's not at all about the future. Coal miners, you know. And I think Liz, nothing epitomizes that more than the spread between let's say the energy sector, as let's just say XLE, relative to ARK ARKK, which is a you know disruptive technology sector that was at the forefront of 2020, 2020 and the first part of uh, 2021, recently had some headways. headways. Liz, it's been remarkable to me, uh, well, you've, you pointed out, number one, that the energy is one of the few sectors, if not one of the only sectors, that's up uh, uh, in the S&P 500 year to date. And also been, been remarkable to me just how uh, steadily XLE has performed ARKK. I've, I've struggled to find you know, more than a handful of days where going long, you know, uh, the XLE relative to ARKK has, has, has uh, done well. What does that signal to you about the market? Do you expect it to continue? Well, there's a lot to unpack uh, in that because if we're comparing XLE, which is the energy sector ETF, to ARK, they, are, they couldn't be further ends of the spectrum, right? They are stark opposites. And ARK is investing in uh, companies that are expected to be very innovative and probably couldn't be more dependent on long-term growth potential and more sensitive to long-term rates or rising rates. So it's no surprise that those companies are seeing a lot of pressure this year. Energy, on the other hand, it isn't quite as black and white as that. So yes, energy generally is thought of as a cyclical asset type, uh, cyclical sector. What we're seeing right now is partially inflation related. And one of the things that you can look at as an indicator of stress in the market, or some people would say impending doom, right, is run-ups in energy prices. Because more often than not, a spike in energy prices has preceded a recession. So although you can, you can paint it as a positive that energy has done well so far this year, meaning that the cyclical sector has done well this year, or you can say, well, okay, it's done okay, it's done well, right? But personally, I'd like it to slow down a little bit because you don't want to see it get out of hand to a point that it stresses not only companies, it stresses consumers in gas, gasoline prices, it stresses airlines and fuel prices, right? So you don't want to see it get out of hand to the point that we start to worry that it's a signal of something terrible on the horizon. Uh, I do, though, think that there is still more runway for energy. Now, I don't think we're at... A breaking point yet uh, we touched we briefly touched 90 the other day in Brent I think that that breaking point is in the triple digits not the double digits um, so we've got a ways to go if there was a time when I would start to worry that energy prices had gotten way out of hand but it is something that you have to watch when they go up this quickly you, I know you're also very constructive on reopening sectors can you tell us a little bit about that does it tie in at all with, uh, well, you know, obviously uh, COVID and, and that, but does it tie at all with short duration or is that theme not really uh, part of your analysis? This has changed a little bit over the last year or so. We used to call the reopening sectors, um, you know, some of those ones that were at the center of the pandemic that got hit the hardest because we shut down. Now it looks a little bit different. I, I would almost prefer, and this is, this is a little nuanced of a statement, but I would almost prefer to say, I'm just not in the stay at home camp anymore. So a lot of the stocks that had benefited because we were staying at home, so things like communications or stay at home workouts, uh, working from home, anything that had benefited on that side of the equation, I think that a lot of the demand that those companies saw and a lot of the run up in price that the stock saw, the strongest stuff is behind us. So we're not going to see that kind of strength going forward. Now, a direct reopening play would be things like travel and leisure. It would be casinos and gaming. It would be event venues. Um, so travel and leisure, including all of the different things like airlines, hotels, um, you know, all of it, right? That stuff, I think, can do well this year because each time we have a new variant, we still get scared and we still do change our behavior a little bit, but we change it less each time and we get over it faster. So there might be a, a minor shock in the short term, but that term becomes shorter and shorter. And as we get further into 2022, I think the travel restrictions get lifted for good in, in more places. We haven't traveled much outside the U.S. as U.S. citizens. 
we're going to start traveling across borders. I think people are hungry to do that more, and I think international travelers are hungry to come back here. I mean, I'm in New York City. It used to be that summer was full of European travelers here, and that obviously has not been the case for the last two years. So a lot of that activity that picks back up is more of the reopening that I'm thinking of now. So it's more the reopening in services, uh, especially travel. Yeah, and I'm going to ask a pretty unscientific question, but if, if we have a spectrum from, from 1 to 10 on how open the economy is and how much people are spending, not just you know on Zoom inside their houses, but they're, they're going out, they're going to restaurants, they're flying, they're staying in hotels. If a 1 is March or April 2020 and a 10 is sort of uh, the most active uh, that the economy can get in the summer, let's say, as you're saying, pre-COVID, where would you say we are now? Completely depends on where you are in the country. Um, you know, I think... Where I am in New York City, I'd give it about a six or a seven. There's still uh, less activity than there would be normally, but there's certainly pockets of it. I mean, we can't do much here without proof of vaccination. So if we want to dine inside at a restaurant, we have to show proof of vaccination. If we want to go to a gym uh, inside and not wear a mask, we have to show proof of vaccination. You have to show it everywhere. It so happens that most of New York City is vaccinated, so that's not an impediment to activity. There are obviously other parts of the country where there's not quite as widespread of a vaccination rate. So if they put that sort of measurement in place, you probably wouldn't see as much activity. But there are also parts of the country I mean, Florida, for example, right, or Texas, parts of Texas that have been pretty open for a while. And even parts of the Midwest have been pretty open for a while and it feels normal. So, you know, and it also depends on if you're in a, a heavily dense metropolitan area versus the suburbs. The suburbs are a little bit easier to get around and uh, different than being, you know, on top of each other like sardines in a place like New York City where we have to be a little more careful. Right. Liz, we're right in the thick of it in terms of earnings seasons. I'm curious, how have you uh, made sense of, of the beats, of the misses? We, we, we spoke earlier that before we were in a place where rewards, uh, 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 beats, earning beats were being rewarded. Now we're in a place where misses, as we saw with Netflix, are, are being punished. And also the, the concept of valuation of stocks. There's price and then there's the, the earnings. So there's earnings and then the, there's the multiple. And t uh, last year, 2021, we, I should say in 2020, earnings obviously were, were quite bad, um, but you, you had a huge multiple expansion. I believe in 2021, actually, earnings were significantly good that um, actually multiples contracted slightly. What is your outlook for 2022 Do you, you know, what, in terms of earnings growth as well as, as the multiple? Well, the first thing that's important to remember is that we measure earnings year over year on a quarterly basis. So Q4 of 2021 is being compared to Q4 of 2020. When you look at things like GDP growth, it's generally measured on a quarter over quarter basis. So Q4 is compared to Q3 of the same year. So um, the, that's what people mean when they talk about base effects. It's what is it compared to? So the growth rate, if you're looking at a very small base, the growth rate is going to seem a little exaggerated. Uh, and that's still the case for the fourth quarter of 2021, which is the earnings season that we're in right now. So expecting somewhere in the low 20% range of growth in earnings for Q4 of 2021. But again, that's compared to Q4 of 2020 when things were still, we had, we had shut back down um, because coronavirus had started spreading again. So anyway, I think this year as rates continue to be in the forefront of everybody's minds, valuations matter a lot more than they did in the last 18 months. And it's not that valuations didn't matter at all, but they mattered a lot less when rates were zero and when liquidity was still plentiful. So going into a period where we're not just tightening in the sense of raising rates, we're tightening in the sense of we're stopping buying bonds and we're thinking about rolling assets off the balance sheet. That's, that's three different steps of tightening. So valuations are gonna matter quite a bit more. It matters what you pay for something and what its long-term prospects are which means that there's more scrutiny on the earnings picture because valuations are a fundamental piece of the equation. Um, Long-term growth potential is another fundamental piece of the equation. And earnings is when we hear from companies about the health of the fundamentals, right? So if we hear from them that they missed estimates, it's gonna get punished more because valuations had been elevated last year and then it starts to be, okay, but now you missed, which changes the outlook then why am I paying this much for the stock? And that's why you see selling pressure on misses. So it's the misses are going to get punished more, 
but it's really more about guidance at this point because the picture is still so cloudy for many companies in 2022 that it's not just about all right what were the results for last quarter it's about what the ceo and the cfo say about their expectations for the coming four quarters Right. I, I noticed in the on, on your 2022 Outlook page um, article, you, you noted that you were con- constructive on a series of sectors. And you mentioned that in the sec- in, in, in the context of earnings growth, uh, I believe it was industrials, perhaps consumer discretionary as well. Is, is your uh, part of your thesis there that the year over year comps will be, be, will be uh, you know, better? Not necessarily. No, uh, you know, I, the sectors are are pretty widely spread as far as what the expectations for earnings growth is. And not all of the ones that I'm constructive on are showing great earnings opportunities in 2022. Financials had a great year in 2021, both earnings and price return. Uh, 2022 is expected to be not necessarily all that exciting for financials as far as earnings go, but I'm still constructive on the sector because of the interest rate picture. So it's not it's not just earnings as the main driver. It's about the environment as well. Um, Consumer discretionary, you have to be choosy in. So when we talked before about some of the reopening plays, when you think about travel and leisure, some of them do fall into that sector. So that's what I mean about being choosy uh, and some of the you know casinos and gaming and, and event venues and that sort of thing would fall into consumer dis- discretionary as well. But there is also a decent amount of consumer discretionary that is looked at as growth. So there's going to be pressure on those stocks. And they had experienced a decent amount of multiple expansion in the last year, uh, too. So you have to pick and choose and decide why you're buying something. Um, industrials, I think, can see decent growth in 2022. It's also a, a spot where you want companies to engage in CapEx. And I think that they should start doing that more in 2022 and industrials is a place where if they're engaging in capex you're going to see that more because it's an asset heavy sector so if you're engaging in capex and and buying hard assets for growing the business industrials is a place where you see that sort of direct benefit Uh, hard assets makes me think about inflation and there there is a fascinating chart on your 2022 outlook Uh, we can put it up that shows the dispersion between the michigan survey of consumer expectations of inflations Uh, So asking sort of the consumer, the person on the street, what it is uh, versus the inflation break even, which is derived from the tips yield, asking the market what they think inflation is going to be. Markedly higher rates of inflation are predicted by the consumer as opposed to the market. Why do you think that is? And and what does that dispersion indicate to you? Um, As consumers, you know, obviously the headlines are dominated by inflation lately. So it's all we're hearing about. It's top of mind. And it's just what the first thing you think about. Uh, Also, it's hitting consumers directly. So food and energy prices have certainly changed, and those are hitting the consumers. So the the sentiment around that and the feeling that they have around what they're paying for food and energy is going to affect that outcome when you survey a consumer. The market is, is looking at depending on the time frame, the market is looking out a certain amount of months or quarters and saying, okay, inflation should moderate. And I think that's probably true. The market also moves quite a bit. And, and frankly, so does consumer sentiment. Consumer sentiment is very fickle. Uh, you could literally survey consumers on the first of the month and survey them on the 20th of the same month and get a completely different reading because something had happened in between or they just change the way that they felt about something, or you just ask the question differently, right? I mean, literally it matters how you take these surveys and when you take them throughout the month. So. The market, though, is looking out a certain amount of months or quarters and saying, okay, we think inflation is going to moderate. We think it probably comes down around this level. The market is also taking into account the power of the Fed and the power that the Fed has to moderate inflation. So I think the market is uh, looking at a few different factors. The market knows that the Fed is going to try to control inflation, whereas the consumer may be less optimistic that the Fed is going to be able to change the price of milk and the price of gas. Right. So it it really does matter on your perspective. I think it does go to show, though, that consumers are feeling the pain of this and it's also necessary to do something about it. Yeah, it's really interesting. How are you handicapping the the ability of the Fed to moderate inflation? Uh, And I'd ask that in, in sort of two two channels. Number one is what is their appetite to, you know, if their only way to do it is to have severe drawdowns in the equity market, you know, how low is the Powell put? That's question number one. Question number two, 
is raising rates even able to moderate inflation if the primary cause, as many, including the Fed, argue of inflation has been supply chain issues? You know, uh, if, if there just aren't enough ships uh, flowing from Vietnam to the port of, of California, of Los Angeles, is, is the Fed funds at 75 basis points really going to affect that? I'll start with the second question first. Raising rates affects demand, not supply. So right now the issue, if you, if you think about a very simplistic definition of inflation, it's more money chasing the same or fewer amounts of goods. So what we've had for the last 18 months was definitely more money, right? Money supply went up due to low rates and asset purchases, so money being put into the economy. So money supply increased. We definitely had more money, check that box, chasing either the same amount or fewer amounts of goods. Uh, yes, across the board, right? Fewer amount of goods because of supply chain issues. We couldn't get everything that we were demanding. Also, consumers bought a lot more stuff, right? Think back to even just household supplies. We bought more toilet paper than we ever would have before. I mean, again, I live in New York. We don't have a lot of storage space. I used to only buy, you know, four or six rolls at a time. And then suddenly it became like, oh, my God, maybe I should buy more because what if there isn't any in a month? So... We bought a lot more stuff and did this sort of stockpiling, hoarding thing of stuff, and we bought it earlier, so holiday shopping happened in November rather than December because people were worried they couldn't get their stuff. So the consumption of goods has gone up, the demand for goods has gone up, the amount of money had gone up, at the same time as supply also being constrained. So when the Fed hikes rates, what it does primarily is reduces the amount of money in the system. So you take that amount of money, and remember what I said about inflation is more money chasing the same or fewer amount of goods. So then uncheck the box about more money, right? So then we take that excess money out of the system. Whether or not supply changes, that already eases the burden of inflation. And it should hopefully, I think this is what the Fed is hoping happens. This is what we talk about when we say Jerome Powell is trying to thread a needle. This is the needle he's trying to thread. We both raise rates and control the money supply, so we reduce the amount of money that's chasing those goods at the same time that the supply chains start to ease up because people have gone back to work, we're reopening the economy, we're not in this stop-start cycle anymore, we've got international economies that are reopened so we can get stuff from their factories. There's a lot of different forces that I think we're all crossing our fingers, they happen at the same time, and that time is about spring of this year. So you could actually see an increase in supply that just happens naturally because supply chains ease up, at the same time as a decrease in, in money supply, which would reduce the amount of demand directly, which should, together, reduce inflation. There was a first question, though, that I don't remember, so you have to <laughs> remind me what the first part of your question oh, oh, was. Oh, yeah, just, just uh, what, if that channel of reducing demand to moderate inflation is effective, what is the Fed's appetite to do that, even if it comes at the cost of higher credit spreads, lower equity prices? Um, so I keep saying this, and maybe it's a little bit more dramatic than it should be, but the Fed doesn't care about our feelings anymore. Right? The Fed cares about inflation. The Fed knows that its job is to control runaway inflation. I don't think we have runaway inflation, but it is to maintain stable prices. And 7% CPI year over year is not stable prices. There are components of the inflation picture that are up double digits and have been for months. That's not stable. So their job now becomes maintaining stable prices. And I think that they are willing to sustain a drawdown on the equity market that's bigger than it has been before. Um, meaning, before, I think what we're conditioned for is that the Fed swoops in and saves us from any drawdowns. And I don't think that's happening anymore because we hit 70 new all-time highs last year. They don't need to save us from drawdowns. We're not in a terrible position. We're down 10% in an index that was up almost 30% last year. Like, I mean, I hate to say it, but that's not that big of a deal. And... I think it's okay with them that that's the case, and it, it has shaken out some of the excess. So that level of, you know, where, where does it become a problem? Where does it actually scare the Fed that they would back off, I think is lower than, than people want it to be. Mm. And would you say that compared to 21, 2021, I take it, but also compared to the past 10 years where inflation was significantly low, that they didn't want to diminish the wealth effect, whereas now, you know, some might argue the wealth effect is, is a little too hot. Yeah, well... They were stuck in a, in a 
precarious situation before, too, because inflation was seemingly dead, right? And it was, how do we stimulate inflation? How do we create inflation? How do we create wage inflation? And if inflation is driven by demand, now some people would argue that there, are, there are two different types of economists. There are demand-side economists and there are supply-side economists. So depending on who you ask, um, I probably err a little bit more on the demand side. But if inflation is driven by demand, I mean, inflation is an indication of healthy demand in an economy. So what we were seeing before, in my opinion, was demand that was less than we really needed it to be. Now we're seeing demand that's well above where we need it to be. We can't even satiate the demand, and we can't satiate the demand for labor either. Now, I'd much rather be in that position than in the one that we were in before all of this began, but I do think that the Fed has to be careful about not slowing down or, or, or using a, a blunt instrument that's going to slam on the brakes, right? And and I think they're going to be very careful about that. You know, I, I, Jerome, the poor guy, Jerome Powell, takes so much flack for, it, did he do this too late? Did, wh- how is he saying things? Is he giving us enough information? Is he giving us too much information? All of this. He is trying, in my opinion, to do this in a graceful fashion that he knows is going to cause some pain in markets, but in the long run, if it's done well and if it's done slowly enough and gracefully enough, it will help the recovery continue because a stoppage of growth will stop the recovery, but high inflation will also stop the recovery. So he has to do this in order to give us a chance to continue on this path. Yeah. And how does the inflation theme shape your view? I know you have a a thesis about heightened currency volatility. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And then how does that relate um, to to crypto perhaps as well? Yeah, so heightened currency volatility is because we're now in a situation where central banks around the globe are moving in different directions. For a long time, they all moved in the same direction and they all sat at zero for this for a long time, right? So now we're getting to the point where they're tightening at different speeds. Some of them aren't ready to tighten at all. China is actually loosening again. And you've got this divergence of monetary policy around the globe. Monetary policy, each central bank has a has an associated currency with it, right? The Fed has the dollar, so on and so forth. The ECB has the euro, you, you, you know, you get the picture. Setting monetary policy directly impacts the value of the currency. So if we're moving in different directions and currencies are a relative game, right? Because there's no such thing as just here's how much the dollar is worth. It's here's how much the dollar is worth versus this other currency. And that goes for every single currency around the globe. So as they're moving in all these different directions, you're going to see more volatility in currency levels throughout the year. And that can create opportunity. That can create arbitrage opportunity. That can create opportunity from a trade perspective. Um, There are a lot of different ways to think about that. That can create opportunity from a commodity perspective, right? If the dollar weakens, most commodities are denominated in dollars, so that makes them cheaper to other parts of the globe. Um, There are a lot of emerging market countries that denominate their debt in dollars. So if the dollar weakens, their debt service suddenly becomes cheaper, which also is good for them. What it also means, though, is that part of the thesis around cryptocurrency is to be decentralized. So the definition of centralization is that you have one central bank that affects one currency, and that is a centralized monetary system. The idea behind crypto is that it's decentralized, so one central bank can affect equally crypto around the globe, and crypto never stops trading, right? Our market closes, Asia opens, right? there, there are markets that are open throughout the day, but they're in different parts of the world. Crypto's trading all the time, and it's not affected just by one central bank. So it's driven the adoption of crypto because there is fear, and, and I think there's some mistrust of policies from central banks. Can they get out of this uh, safely? that has driven a lot of adoption in crypto. So that's why we saw such uh, appetite for it last year. And it just has become more mainstream for a lot of investors. But the reality of what's happening so far in 2022 is that crypto is not really acting like people wanted it to, right? We thought that it would be an inflation hedge and that has not worked out that way. Uh, I think Bitcoin peaked on November 9th most recently, and it has been in a pretty steep downward trend since then. So 
it's still in a price discovery phase. It's still a very volatile asset. And in times like this, when the, the entire market is a little trepidatious, it doesn't trade like a store of value. It trades like a risk asset. So that's what we're seeing right now. And that may be the case for a good part of 2022, because this is where market sentiment is. And that's just a fact of life. Uh, very interesting. Liz, you've been very generous with, with your time. I know you're on a busy schedule. My, my final question for you would be perhaps a psychological one. I've, I've heard you say recently that the extremely vicious sell-off in March 2020, it was so steep and so fast that it, it, uh, you know investors who bought the dip and bought it quickly were rewarded, in some cases, quite handsomely. Uh, how do you think that uh, affects investor psychology now? And how should, you know, obviously, you know, not investment advice, but how should investors be thinking about uh, sort of the risk and reward and allocations at, at this time? So I think it gives people recency bias. And what I mean by that is, uh, if you even just think about the last three years, so even pre-pandemic, so if we take 2019, 2020, and 2021, the total return on the S&P 500 was 31% in 2019, 18% in 2020, and 28% in 2021. That is highly abnormal. And the recency bias is telling investors that they're going to be disappointed with anything under 15 to 20% in returns. The reality of it is that the average total return on the S&P annually is about 11.5%. And I'd be really happy with 11.5% this year. Uh, and that average has moved up because of the great returns we've had in the last three years. It used to be, when, when I started in the business, the average was about 7%, 7 or 8%. So when you look at those averages, it brings you back down to earth a little bit. But I think it has set people's expectations to be a little bit too lofty. And there, if you're a newer investor, not only if you just bought the dip, if you were a newer investor, and there were many, many of these who came into the market for the first time after the pandemic, you have never seen this environment before. You've never seen a tightening cycle. And even old investors, I'll even call myself an old investor at this point, have never seen, maybe not never, some of us have never seen a tightening cycle coupled with this high of inflation. Inflation has not been this high since the year I was born. So unless you are about 15 or 20 years older than me, you haven't seen this either. <laughs> so this is a new environment for a lot of investors, and it's something that uh, newer investors in particular are not conditioned for because they haven't, see they haven't participated in that big drawdown, and they haven't participated in, in the recovery afterwards. So it feels more emotional, it feels more short-term, and it's difficult to, to get optimistic about it and look through a long-term lens when the short-term pain feels very, very bad. And it is very much a psychological question. So we've got recency bias fighting against us. There's also a, a theory called loss aversion, where the pain of a loss hurts twice as badly as the joy of a gain feels, right? So you lose $5, it hurts twice as bad as gaining $5 feels. So there's that too. I mean, people that are down a lot in some of those growth stocks are, they're feeling a little wounded right now and it's tough to get back on the horse. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Liz, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure hearing your insights. Uh, people can find your, your writings at SoFi.com and uh, your Twitter handle is at Liz Young Strat. Liz, thank you so much. Thank you.